Bjorn. Når vi går. Når vi nu går. Stop! Don't you run to me? Don't you run to me? Show to me. Yes, he. Cut! Okay, 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 okay. What prompted me to choose Katsu as one of these three films which I made in a series for PBS was that the first one was about a bunch of lunch makers who were lovely people but very benign. And the third one was about a family of farmers in extreme northern Japan in the snow country. And I thought, lest the American uh, viewing audience suppose that everything in Japan was beautifully packaged on the one hand and rurally benign on the other, I, I thought, who's the most virulent character that I've known in my long years in Japan? And immediately I thought of Katsu Shintaro. He was directing himself in one of the episodes of the new Zatoichi tales, which he was both writing, starring in, producing, and everything else for Fuji Television. That was after the long movie run in the late 1970s. And of course, Katsu completely lost himself, and we got him from every which way in the course of the three months that we did this. So it was a very telling and revealing portrait. I had a connection to Katsu, which came through Teshigahara Hiroshi. I made a movie with Teshigahara called Summer Soldiers, which I wrote and we made together. Hiroshi was the son of the great flower arranger. Katsu was the son of the head of a shamisen school, the three-string plectrum played instrument, which is used in Japanese oratorio and so on. So he had grown up uh, expected to take over his father's troupe, and they had this sort of black sheep notion in common. One went into directing, the other went into acting, despite the pressure from the family. The story of Katsu's rise to fame is very interesting because it's absolutely connected to the Zatoichi story. In the mid-1950s, he suddenly found himself anxious to become a movie star. So he traveled to the United States, had a meeting with James Dean somehow, and said, that's me, I'm going to become a great movie. So he came back to Japan, and between 1958 and 1961, he played a, a number of not very distinguished or memorable roles as the kind of second romantic lead. Then, all of a sudden, a script came in to the studio, which was about this blind swordsman. Katsu had been trained as a child to play the shamisen by a teacher who was blind. So Katsu said, I know how to do blind better than anyone. Give me a shot at this. This was in early 1962. And so the first black and white Zatoichi came out with Katsu Shintaro being the blind swordsman. And he became an instant movie star and it went on like that for 25 features thereafter. Well. And in Katsu, you see the sort of male chauvinist emperor majesty reigning over his uh, aides, his attendants, the women whom he's dealing with. I mean, he was an explosively amorous enthusiastic, energetic creature. Also, if you look at the film carefully, you'll see that he was a very finely calibrated artist. So you have this combination of male Japanese macho in its extreme form and a very subtle, even delicate, finely calibrated observation and sensitivity. <laughs> If you go back far enough, before the raucous urban culture, which begins in the 17th century in Japan, the warrior from the eastern Japan comes to Kyoto and gets involved in the imperial court. And out of that marriage, you get the Japanese warrior poet. You have this image in Japan, this notion of poetic delicacy on the one hand with fierce martial competency on the other. When you think about that combination, that's precisely what Zatoichi, the blind swordsman, himself conveys. A kind of murderous cold-heartedness on the one hand and a kind of 
saccharin, sugar sweet, sensitivity on the other. And when those two things converge, you get this killer, wonderful matinee idol hero who has among his fan base both the most macho, tattooed gangsters on the one hand and old grannies on the other. Ah, ah, Kimotiak got the raw. Yeah, 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 what accounted for Katsu's success? I think it was very different from the ordinary so-called chambara, where people are just being cut up and down in every which way by a swordsman. First of all, the iai nuki, the drawing the blade out of the scabbard, slicing with it, and then bringing it back more quickly than the sighted eye could follow, and then shuffles on away. This kind of thing was immediately arresting to even the most macho followers of sort of military martial arts stuff. Katsu increasingly had a say and a hand in creating the character. He began writing the scripts. It was he who, in fact, began to think up many of the more spectacular routines and gimmicks that went on. And so over time, he projected himself into this character to an extent that I would say that Zato Ichi really was a cinematic reflection of Katsu Shinjiro, the person. I really believe that. From the very beginning, and I don't know whether Katsu actually had a chance to influence the first scripts, but increasingly, very quickly, you get this whole other dimension of sweetness of semi-sweetness, you know, the blind swordsman stops and he goes, ah, oh, Otento-sama, the sun is kissing my cheek. How beautiful is that? And people would just swoon. You know, one of the things is about Zatoichi on the road with an infant. I mean, this is the kind of sentimentality, if you will, which has deep roots in 17th and 18th century Japanese popular culture, the combination Robin Hood, because he always sides with the underdog. And it was also very asexual, it was very amorous, Katsu, but you never see much sex. <laughs> <laughs> All of these things were new and uh, quite extraordinary, really, and deserve attention, critical attention, really, because of the character that they produced. <laughs> Katsu, in fact, had the same kind of instinctive, impressionistic simplicity that Zato Ichi himself has. He was, of course, very conscious of dramatic effects, and so he was a conniver and a manipulator. <laughs> Seems to me that he had a gut feeling for what would work, and you can see him doing that, actually, in the film, particularly at the end, he says, you know, we're gonna get to this point, and then people are going to applaud, and we'll give them a minute. <laughs> You know, he's always thinking about histrionic effect, but he's not thinking about it from a sort of an objectified intellectual place somewhere. So it's, here's what's going to work in terms of feeling. When we first arrived in Kyoto with this crew of mine, which was Teshigahara's crew, who had shot Woman of the Dunes and everything else, and we were warned if one of our guys should cast a shadow with his boom on Katsu's stuff or something, all hell could break loose. 
and everybody was very nervous about this. And on the first day, and Katsu comes out and he says, okay, this is my friend John Nathan, friend of Teshigahara Hiroshi, by the way. He's gonna make a movie about me. I want him to make a movie about me. I want everybody should behave like brothers. Is that cool? And that was the end of this. That was it. Okay, everybody knew, step out of line and you're gonna get in huge trouble. Not from me, but from him. So that was magnificent. It really was. <laughs> But filming Katsu was a horrible nightmare that went on for several months and put many of my crew in the hospital for various reasons, exhaustion, fights along the way. Katsu was a completely unpredictable character who lived his life without any schedules except those that he created himself. And the only way to do that was to be on call, to have his right-hand guy who's in the film call us and say, well, Katsu is going to this disco. He's going to rent the disco out for the evening. There's a scene in the film. He's accompanied by the marvelous Baisho Mitsuko, who's this beautiful young actress. Katsu's explaining that he has punched someone. And she's saying, you know, you're really crazy. And it, it develops that he had punched the taxi cab driver because he thought the taxi cab driver was making a pass at Baisho. And that generates this whole conversation about that's really the way we Japanese are, so inconsiderate. I want consideration. And he was really a very, very Japanese fella. The fact that he sent his two kids to an English-speaking school was a sort of an affectation of his own, and perhaps uh, his beautiful wife who was the great actress, maybe had had a voice in that. But generally speaking, Katsu's values were not particularly um, influenced by or leavened by a much sophistication about Western things. The beautiful, gorgeous woman who's in my documentary, Baisho Mitsuko, who became a very famous Japanese actress, was married to a pro wrestler named Antonio Enoki. This was a terrifying character, a Brazilian Japanese guy, enormous, and a real killer in the ring. Well, during this long time in Kyoto with Mitsuko, Katsu developed kind of, you know, a certain intimacy with her, and people were watching because the standard procedure was that Katsu would eventually appropriate his star on some level or another, who knew? And there's a scene in my film where they're dancing to Stevie Wonder's superstition. Katsu sort of gets a little too, and she goes, and everybody was, you know, Antonio, you know, gonna come and kill this man. Katsu insisted on looking at the final cut of this film. He was hiding in a hotel because the cops were after him for some kind of drug violation. The only thing he asked me to cut was a slightly even more intimate moment with Baisha because I think he was terrified that Antonio Inoki would see this and come over and pull him limb from limb. I was always interested throughout in conveying certain things that I felt were very unusual and very representative of him. So if whatever a scene you see in there is, I hope, conveying something outrageous or sensitive or commanding. I had that marvelous, I think, interview with his right-hand guy who just takes unbelievable pain from this man and loves him right back and who ventures in the course of the interview on camera say you know I love him but he really shouldn't drink so much
ないもん怒られちゃうそういつぶつかっちゃったじゃない I'm always trying in that film to give you a sense of the dimensionality, which is why I so was eager and, and happy to have a chance to watch him with his father on the shamisen toward the end of the film. It's the only time we've ever seen him bow in that movie is when his dad is listening to him as he tunes and he goes, and you can feel in that gesture the respect for the father, which is imbued in this character no matter how outrageously Um, he behaves. We're out on location one day, and it turns out that my birthday was March 5, and we were shooting on March 5. And we were walking around this riverbank, and we, we, we found these stones. And so Katsu said, well, we have to commemorate your birthday or something. So Katsu said to me, is there some way to say in English the equivalent of On this day, I met a man with a will of stone. I said, oh, yes. And so I wrote, you know, on this day, I met a man with a will of stone. And I had these five stones. And he said, you give me those stones, and I will keep these stones until I die. And if anybody ever tries to take these stones from me, I will destroy them. And I said, well, I, I want a set, too. He said, ah, that's what it is about you, John. So we got another five stones, and I wrote again. On this day, I met a man with a will of stone, and I still have them somewhere. You know, that's pretty schmaltzy, you know, but that was the blind swordsman. And I rest my case on that, you know. Okay. 